My name is Rebecca Foos. I'm with the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. And thank you to our committee who has put together this season's uh, programming. I have a lot to learn today. Uh, we're going to talk about science, emerging science, the next big thing. And here as our speakers are Jim Sider, the president of Sider Optics, and Tom Batley, the director of the Rochester Regional Photonics Cluster. And they're going to tell us about some of the uh, new developments in optics, photonics, and other sciences in the Rochester area. So join me in welcoming our guests today. Thanks, everyone. I'm Tom Batley with the Rochester Regional Photonics Cluster. This is my colleague, Jim Sidor, the president and CEO of Sidor Optics. Um, you know, just before we started, I was teasing one of our friends. She wanted to take our photograph. You know, this, this camera here. Is there film in that camera? No. I don't think so, right? I, and, and what I was teasing about was this is the most sophisticated photonics device that you see every day. People are carrying these. More and more people are carrying these. Um, sometime between uh, the year uh, 2008 and 2013, we accelerated to the point where across the planet, the number of photographs that are being taken due largely to the fact that we, many of us carry these, exceeded four billion a year. So everybody's pushing the button. So, so what is photonic about this device? The sophisticated lens that allows you to take long range or short range photographs with great clarity. Uh, the sensor that takes the picture, the software that captures the image, and the display on the front of the phone that, that displays the high definition image. Those are all photonics devices. When you transmit the information, it goes to a mobile tower. As soon as it hits the tower, it's turned into digital information, which is transmitted via dense wave division multiplexing, kind of like a, a rainbow through a fiber optic tube that transmits information. And all of those things are photonic. So this is a very sophisticated photonics device. And George Eastman, as you all are very familiar with George Eastman, more and more photos are taken now than ever before. And it all started with, with George Eastman. And uh, there's a picture at the Eastman house. And if you're standing 30, 40 feet away, you see a picture, a headshot of, of George Eastman. And as you get closer, it's made up of thousands of little photographs. Yeah, little, each little micro pixel of the photograph is a photograph in itself. So uh, I'm not sure if George Eastman is really happy they're not using film anymore, but uh, certainly more and more people are taking photographs. I have 3,000 photos on my camera. So. No, but in fact, George Eastman was just one of a few camera companies that were started in Rochester, New York. And as my friend uh, Peter Holleran at Cognitive Marketing is fond of saying, Rochester, New York built Eastman Kodak George, East, George Eastman did not build Eastman Kodak. Rochester built Eastman Kodak. Bausch and Lam preceded uh, Eastman Kodak by probably 30 or 40 years. And what was that company built on <coughs> was creating devices using glass, using optics, and, and they brought the talent from Europe. So the, the, the talent to produce optics had existed. That's OK. Oh. Oh, I, I was going to kick into that. OK, sorry. <clears throat> so in fact, the talent to produce the optics in Rochester, New York, was here when George, George Eastman started his company. So he was a lucky guy to try and start that company in Rochester, New York. Um, how many of you have a pretty good idea what photonics is? Raise your hand. OK. I want each of you to come up and explain it, because I can't. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to give you a little perspective on, on what photonics is uh, and the fact that it is an essential technology, an essential global technology. So in, on December 3rd last year, 
the United Nations and UNESCO officially endorsed 2016, 2015 as the year of light and light-based technologies. So the International Year of Light will be in 2015. This is a UNESCO and United Nations effort. Um, health, communications, economy, environment, social, social sciences, technology, sustainability, development, education, nature, culture, photonics is everywhere in our lives. And in fact, it, it's the, the basis technology for so many things and has become that so rapidly that we kind of take it for granted. These are the partners, the hundred or so partners from 70 or more nations that lobbied the United Nations to make 2015 the year of light. So that's kind of international recognition for how important these technologies are. And the only thing that the UN Council and UNESCO had a problem with was this word. They said, nobody knows what that means. And I say, did you ever watch Star Trek? Yes? Anybody know what Star Trek was? You remember photon torpedoes? So in physics, it's kind of a dichotomy that light particles are also waves. So if you ask somebody like Jim, who understands more about optics than I'll ever know, Light is both a wave and a particle, but it can be used to, to, great ex, to, to very powerful extents. And photon torpedoes, you know, were, were predicted, uh, what, 40 years ago? Star Trek was on the air. So people knew what photons were and what their potential was. I think the first laser was demonstrated around 1960. Mm -hmm. and, and shortly after that, they started imagining what are photons going to do in the future. So here's Thomas Edison in, 19, in 1879, and that's a, an Edison bulb that was blown by Corning, the only people who could produce that bulb. And Thomas Edison said, we're striking it big in the electric light, better than my vivid imagination fir first conceived. Where this thing is going to stop, Lord only knows. So the, you know, he knew something important was about to happen. Here's a guy sitting in the first electric car in 1914. Do you think that this guy knew what electronics was in 1914? Right, I, I don't even know if the word had been coined. Well, my point is that here we are in 2014, and that is exactly where we are with photonics. So it's simple, this is for you to remember, you can tell your friends tonight, dinner table, lunch conversation, electron, electronics, photon, photonics. Photonics is the generation, transmission, detection, and sensing of light. And it is everywhere in the world. It's, it's un Does anybody recognize this image? Did you have this on the cover of an album in your album collection? I remember from Sysco. There you go. So a photon is a molecule of light. That's what a photon is. Right. So everything that, that we accomplished with electrons we're now trying to do with photons or a combination of the two. And, and where is it? It's in analytical sciences, defense and security, entertainment, uh, environment, health, industrial manufacturing, lighting and energy, photovoltaics, uh, research, telecom, transportation. These are all examples of industrial applications of optics and photonics. So Jim's company uh, was, you want to talk a little bit about uh, CIDOR optics? Sure, sure. So Rochester, being with Eastman Kodak, Bausch & Lomb, Xerox, every Xerox machine in the early days had a lens system in there before they went over to digital. So Rochester is is back about, uh, you know, during, you know, Doyle administration was the imaging capital of the world. We like to call Rochester the optics capital of the world. You know, Tom talked about, you know, photonics and okay, that's kind of a, you know, high tech word. Uh, when I tell people I'm in the optics business, they said, oh great, I could use a new pair of glasses, give me a deal. I couldn't make a pair of eyeglasses to save my life. Um, 
So the word photonics, optics, you know, w w there's a big debate. What, what do we call it? But Rochester, the optics capital of the world, Bausch and Lomb, Eastman Kodak, there were thousands and thousands of people in Rochester involved in the optics and photonics business. Uh, our company uh, started uh, 50 years ago. My dad, at, at 50 years old, decided to you know start the company. He worked at Eastman Kodak at Bausch and Lomb. He was an immigrant that came over in the in the in the 30s, uh, you know, from Ukraine, and you know. Kodak, Bausch and Lomb, they're always hiring people. He started working optics. He was fascinated by optics. He worked on, uh, you know, part-time at many optical companies. There were probably, at that time, you know, 50 other optical companies in Rochester, small companies, Wollensock over on Hudson Avenue, LG over on Portland Avenue. Uh, some are still around. JML started, you know, in the 60s. They're still around. Cider Optics is still around. Planar Optics is still around. Rochester Precision Optics was the optical systems manufacturer for Eastman Kodak Company. That was purchased about seven years ago, and they brought 30 of the people from that optics group over to their new uh, site on uh, John and Bailey Road in Henrietta. Today they employ more than 200, and they're embarking on new product lines. So it's a uh, yeah, it's 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 a growing field. Um, so, my father always had this idea of starting his own company. Apparently, he never really talked about it because, you know, back in the day, you didn't really talk about your goals and your feelings and things like that. But I can tell you that there were optical machines in our garage. There were optical machines in your garage. My my old neighbors from my old neighborhood. There were optical machines in my aunt and uncle's garage on Merchants Road. So my dad always had this idea of starting this company. He worked part-time, full-time full at Kodak, part-time at a lot of these optical companies. Whenever, whenever an optical company was busy, this is again going during the war, during the 40s, uh, you know, he, he was on loan to Bausch & Lomb because they were, they were doing, you know, range finders or binoculars. They did the Norden bomb site that, that was very instrumental and accurately, you know, bombing the em enemy. Um, he also, with his knowledge, he was asked to go and work on the 200-inch Mount Palomar telescope mirror, Caltech in Pasadena. And, and in the early 40s, he went out to Ca California, lived and worked out there, uh, took my mother, who they got married in Rochester, they went out there and, and uh, lived for three or four years. When the project was done, came back to Rochester, went back to work in Eastman Kodak, because of his experience with the Mount Palomar, 200-inch Mount the telescope, which was, you know, high tech at the time, they asked him in the 50s, in the mid 50s, to work with Smithsonian Institute and set up the satellite tracking cameras that they used to track satellites. And the first satellite, the Sputnik, the Russian Sputnik, you know, he they had the system set up and then kept building. There was 19 stations around the world that my father was instrumental in you know, fabricating the optics and, and then uh, out to install the optics. So he wasn't home a lot, but when he did come home, uh, you know, he had stories that uh, my show and tell at school was awesome. <laughs> started the company in 64, got tired of traveling, started the company in 64, and as I mentioned, you know, we're in business 50 years. I joined the company in 78, so I got 36 years in with the company, but Back when he started the company in '64, I was 13 years old. So I, you know, painted machines, cleaned machines, you know, squirt this, do this, do that. I mean, I was kind of involved, not knowing what I was doing, just doing what I was told. So our company today, we have 75 employees. Um, like Tom mentioned, a lot of. Play the video. Is oh. This, is this stuff in the video? Yeah, let's play the video. Play I got a five-minute video, so you can see what my company looks like and. And we can chat about it afterwards. At Cider Optics, our world is flat. We produce flat optics, wedged optics, prisms, all flat surfaces. Cider Optics is the best double-sided grinding and polishing company in the world. 
We have produced optics used in the high-powered laser applications with the toughest specifications. The technology that we have at Cider Optics is the latest and greatest. We produce about 20,000 optical components per month. My father started this company in 1964. He's had an extensive career in optics and he was fortunate to be chosen to work on the 200 inch mount polymer telescope in Pasadena, California. And because of his experience, he was chosen to work with the uh, Smithsonian Institute to set up the satellite tracking cameras uh, and the start of our space program. Where I think CIDR Optics is going in the future is we'll continue to grow and give our customers the quality and uh, the service that they require. Cider Optics currently has the largest inventory of double-sided machines polishing precision optics in the United States. We can polish large windows up to 740 millimeters in diameter and thin wafers down to 150 microns. The double-sided polishing process typically yields fractional wave transmitted wavefront and exceptional parallelism. Cider Optics also double-sided processes smaller, finer parts for various applications such as DNA sequencing, diffractive optical elements, microlens arrays, and telecom polarizers. Traditional pitch polishing involves the skills of highly experienced opticians who have an exceptional understanding of optical polishing techniques as parts produced here typically have very stringent cosmetic, surface flatness, and surface roughness specifications. CNC machining of glass parts in a variety of materials requires the most complicated geometries and tightest tolerances for optical or mechanical use. Cider Optics pairs up-to-date CNC milling equipment technology from Haas, along with custom design tooling to machine custom features such as chamfers, counterbores, through holes, slots and steps, along with a variety of shapes. Cider can also machine or drill in alignment to previously machined or patterned features. And for larger volume projects, we employ the use of a robot to load and unload the CNC machines. All of our optics are inspected visually for cosmetics, based upon the specifications and intended use. Cider Optics offers an assortment of dimensional and optical measurements using several different types of interferometers with size capabilities up to 450 millimeters. We also test for roughness with optical surface profilers. We provide inspection data packages ranging from verification to sampling to measuring every attribute and feature on all parts. High technology demands ever cleaner parts, and to meet those demands, Cider Optics now offers cleaning and packaging in a class 10,000 clean room with two automated, multi-bath, water-based ultrasonic cleaning systems. For glass wafers between 100 and 200 millimeter diameters, we also offer a secondary rinse process involving spin rinse dryers for improved cleaning. Cider Optics produces optical components for a large variety of applications and markets, such as windows for aerial reconnaissance, 3D motion picture cameras, and high-energy laser systems, glass wafers for microfluidics, and refractive and diffractive microoptics, coating substrates for fluorescence microscopy and laser-grade filters, colored filters for cinematography and spectroscopy instrumentation, plate beam splitters for heads-up displays in international military and commercial aircraft, and machined glass parts for antenna windows and optomechanical mounts. Cider Optics is on the cutting edge of a lot of the technologies. Our customer success is our success. Tell us your requirements. We will provide you with our best price and our best delivery, and I know that you'll be pleased with our product. At Cider Optics, our world is flat. Do you think your dad had any clue what the company was going to become when he started polishing the Palomar telescope? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, um, what's, what's impressive about that, I mean, what you saw there was a manufacturing shop in Rochester, New York. And what do you employ? 75, 80 yeah, people? 75 something people. like that. 
Um, what's impressive is that that's, that sort of thing is going on at small companies all around Rochester. And um, let's see here. Let me, let me go to the next step of this PowerPoint presentation. So you had a chance to take a look at these various applications. We could do 15 pages of this. I mean, so many things in our lives are changing because of uh, medical devices. Um, have you seen any of the pictures that have been uh, that have been that have come back from the Mars rover or any of the NASA space shots, the flybys of Jupiter? Every one of those images was captured through a lens made in Rochester, New York. Every image that you see from a satellite surrounding, you know, floating in space, looking back at the planet, whether you look, they're looking at the, the oceans to see where they're healthy or the forests to see where they're healthy or, or watching us, what we're doing in our backyard, yards for some reason. All of those images are through lenses uh, that are made in Rochester, New York. Has any of you seen a 3D film in the movie theater? If you have, you have seen them on a projector that's projecting images through lenses made at sight or optics. So Rochester's products are everywhere in the world in every conceivable application. Now Jim and I last week were at Photonics West in San Francisco. It's the largest photonics conference in the world. 1,260 exhibitors, 21,000 attendees, six days of meetings, conferences, and technical meetings. 76 of the exhibitors are from New York State, most from the Finger Lakes. And you see here, it's hard to get the scale of this. This is two, you just see a fraction of one room, but in fact, it's two gigantic rooms uh, as big as football fields. And over here is the New York sign, and there's an entire New York pavilion of nothing but New York companies. And when people walk into that room and they see the New York sign, if they need optics and photonics products, they go straight to New York. Our aisle is crowded with people looking for vendors. So if you look at the 1,008 companies uh, that they could get Dun & Bradstreet data for, those companies at that show represent 84 billion in global photonics core component sales. The, the market is about 480 billion, so the people that are at that conference exhibiting represent about 18% of the global market, the worldwide mar market for photonics compl components. That's lasers, optics, solid state lighting, all manner of components for optics and photonics. Does anyone know what a NAICS code is? So the government, when they try and analyze the economy, and especially manufacturing economy, they assign each different manufacturer a special code depending on what it is they do. So at Photonics West, all of the people that exhibit there self-identified with more than 180 NAICS codes. So this makes it really hard for us to divine, define who the industry is. So in Rochester, there are probably 30 or 40 different NAICS codes for optics and photonics companies. But it's also that diversification of applications of photonics that make the industry so strong. Well, in a diversified industry, what you, what you find is a lot of mergers and acquisitions of companies. If you look at just the Rochester companies, or just the New York State companies, uh, SPIE, the International Society, says that, that just in New York State, the companies have almost $9 billion in sales and 33,000 employees. Independent research by the U of R says that our, my, the membership of Rochester Regional Photonics Cluster is about 3 billion in sales and 17,000 employees. In terms of acquisitions, companies that were created in Rochester, New York, grown in Rochester, New York, have been acquired by, you know, conglomerates. Uh, many of them still stay in Rochester, New York. Some of them end up moving. These are just some recent acquisitions in the Rochester region of small companies that are still here that have been acquired just this group here probably employs, uh, I would say, 400 people these four, at these five different companies. 
So in the Rochester region, we've got about 75 members of Optics and Photonics Cluster, 17,000 employees, over three billion in annual sales. If you look at the small and medium-sized companies, those are the ones that are fewer than 500 employees. They've been growing at five to seven percent since about 2010. We've got Monroe Community College Optical System Technology Program developing the workforce. We're responsible for, in Rochester for educating about 70% of the optics PhDs working in the United States. And in Rochester, one in 14 households is supported by our industry. We're home to the nation's laboratory for laser energetics. It's the second largest ultraviolet uh, laser for uh, internal confinement fusion in, in the world. The University of Rochester Institute of Optics, RIT's uh, Imaging Science and Microelectronics schools. We have the Navy Small Business Innovation and Research Conference here twice a year. These are all the applications that the Navy's looking at for using optics. And we host OptiFab, the only optical fabrication conference in the United States. Rochester is responsible for generating a vast number of the nation's patents in optics, photonics, and imaging. Very happy, ha uh, high uh, per capita patent rate. And 95% of the optics and photonics and imaging patent holders still live in the Rochester region. So the whole world still sees us as a center for talent and looks to us for components and products in this industry. We have the most robust, sophisticated, and highly integrated uh, supply chain in the nation and top suppliers for all of these industries. We've got a little sheet back there. Unfortunately, we didn't bring enough for everyone in the room, but there's a, there's some CIDAR optics information back there, and there are some sheets that share some of this data here um, for, for, with the group. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about any of those statistics. Do you want to talk about, I think, um, the Laboratory for Laser Energetics? They're a customer of yours, aren't sure. they? Yeah, so th this, uh, we, we make a, a window for them. We make a lot of optics. U University of Rochester, you know, we've, we've made optics for students, uh, graduate students, the, the, the professors, uh, PhD students. Uh, Alexis, who is an adjunct professor at MCC, you know, we made optics for her uh, 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 PhD dissertation. You know, she defended her, her her thesis and you know the, the Rochester um, the University of Rochester besides the laser lab I'll tell you a story about one of our biggest customers uh, so the 3d movie thing uh, when you see a 3d movie advertised it's in real D that customer is in Colorado their optical engineers are graduates from the University of Rochester. We did optics for them when they were students, when they were working on their PhD. They went to and worked on their career and ended up at Real D. When they were working on the technology, they came back to us and we worked on the prototypes. Uh, make me five of these, 10 of those, 20 of these. Okay, it looks good. Make me 100 systems. Okay, make me 300 systems. Each system has six components that we make. Came time for 3,000 systems. So that would be 18,000 pieces of glass. Rectangular glass like this, different sizes, different thicknesses, and different when we, coatings. And when you say glass, how many different kinds of glass do you use in your shop typically? A couple hundred. Right. It so all looks a, the same. It's not the kind of not, not the kind of glass you see in windows. Some of it is not even transparent, but it transmits certain wavelengths of light. So when he mentions glass, it could be any of a uh, couple of hundred different uh, materials. So when they came and they wanted three thousand systems, which is eighteen thousand pieces of glass, we gave them our price, and they went to China. And then about six months later, before Avatar came out. You remember Avatar? Was the that first was big the first 3D movie? 3D movie. It was a $300 million movie. Went over budget by $200 million. But so the, so the debut of Avatar is set 
but they don't have enough projectors for the rest of the country. They're right. They went to right. China. Right. So China, they they were missing deliveries, missing the quality. The flatness has to be flat within a couple millions of an inch. Parallelism has to be flat within a few millions of an inch. They couldn't produce it regularly. So the customer came back to us and said, we, we need 3,000 systems. We kept the price the same. We worked like... It was very kind. We worked like... Well, they had them our, over a our, barrel. No, nah, no, nah, uh, our price is our price. Oh, that's nice. So we were able, and, and they didn't know, if, if Avatar wasn't successful, if it wasn't the, the, the block, blockbuster that it was, I think it made a couple billion dollars, we would, we would not be working on 3D projection optics. It was wildly successful, went from 3,000 systems to 10,000 systems, 60,000 pieces of glass, hence the robot that you saw in the video because we just couldn't handle it. We spent, you know, four or five million dollars on new equipment. We hired 20 or 30 people to keep up with the demand. Went from 10,000 systems. So now we're about market saturation. Uh, there's winding down. So, you know, we did seven million dollars with them in 2011, did four million dollars with them in 2012. We're, we're down to a couple million dollars with them. But that's a story. It started at the U of R, went to Colorado. We're working on the optics for this group because of the relationship we had with the U of R. Right. U, U if, of R. If you, if you walk through, I showed you Photonics West earlier, that conference we were at last week. If I walk through that conference with Jim Sidor, we will never get to the New York Isle. That's that's how integrated and connected the optics and photonics industry is in the country. Is everyone knows one another. If you need flats, you call Sidor. If you need certain kinds of uh, measurement systems, you call Lumetrics. If you need night vision systems, you call Rochester Precision Optics. So so the the network of companies in the country is such that. If you work in the industry, you know, still know that Rochester is the, the center for optics in the country. Yes. The, the bit about your company and so all these fantastic, complex machines. Where do those machines come from? Uh, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, mostly. Uh, really? Yeah. Uh, our, some of our metrology comes from Tropel out in Fairport, which Corning now owns. Uh, the machines, uh, the Carlisle, Pennsylvania, P.R. Hoffman is where I have most of my machines. They're great people to deal with. I try and buy, you know, American if I can. Um, now that's, that's making flats. So if you want to make sophisticated shapes, uh, like an aspheric lens, which is, remember, remember when suddenly um, pocket cameras showed up? And, and prior to that, everyone had a camera with a with a big lens on the front like this an SLR right if you wanted a nice camera you had to have multiple interchanging lenses and suddenly everyone had a pocket camera and now you have a camera like this that turns in good pictures and how did that happen well the, the that technology is when you the, that camera there has a lens on it that has uh, several lenses in line it's like an assembly of multiple lenses and if you want a wide angle, you swap it out for different shapes. Well, they were all spheric, convex, concave. Aspheric lenses allow you to build a compound lens like that into one element. If you want to buy aspheric lenses in the uh, machines that make aspheric lenses in the world today, there are probably four companies that mm -hmm. will make them. Mm -hmm. Two of them are in Rochester, New York. QED and OptiPro. And the next step beyond aspheric is freeform. And freeform optics is so complex, I don't even know how to talk about it uh, rationally. But Rochester is the, at the forefront of it, and the University of Rochester has a center for freeform <coughs> optics. Nose cones for missiles, basically. Yes? <coughs> Great. They're my second largest customer. Corning is in my on my board of directors. Uh, in fact, this is, I'll, I'll give Jim Sidor a plug. Two years ago, uh, the optics program at MCC was floundering. 
So I, Jim Sidor and I would go out to dinner, and Jim would say, "What are we going to do? That I, you know, I, so much of our talent came from the program, but MCC doesn't seem to be able to to really figure out how to market the program." <clears throat> we we started a high school program that connects people at East High, Gates, Chile, and Greece with MCC. We went to Corning and said. You have a location in Rochester that employs close to 200 people, and they're all starting to get a little long in the tooth. Where are you going to get your talent from? Uh, we don't know. So I talked to the senior vice president of Corning, you know, the number two guy, and I said, you guys need to come up with a half million dollars to buy new lab equipment and support <coughs> a new uh, optics program at MCC. Kodak used to sponsor it. They no longer sponsor it. Corning's prestigious name attached to the program will help us market it. They hemmed, they hawed, we went through processes, we met with the foundation, and one day we're sitting with the director of the foundation, and Jim Sidor sitting at the table and says, if you give MCC a half million dollars, I'll match it with 250000 Two weeks later, the grant was approved, and now the MCC program, which two or three years ago was graduating maybe one or two people yeah, and had a few enrollees, currently has 50 enrollees. So the pro program is up and running, and that's, again, that's all relationship-based. Corning knows that this is the source of talent, that they have a location here, and they wanted to support that program. And, um, and I'm a graduate of the MCC optics program, by the way. And so is... Mike Mandina that owns Optimax, president of Optimax, employs 200 people. People with two-year degrees. <clears throat> Tony Marino, Advanced Glass Industries, he has probably 50 people. So between us, we have almost 400 people, you know, working with, with only two-year degree, you know, CEOs. But I want to point out that we're up against tremendous international competition. So. In 1998, Congress commissioned a study from the National Academies, and it was released, and it was called Harnessing Light, Optical Science and Engineering for the 21st Century. It predicted a lot of the things that we're taking for granted now. Um, if we got rid of all the incandescent light bulbs in the United States and replaced them with compact fluorescents or LEDs, uh, we could save $20 billion a year in this country in electricity. So you've seen that kind of move to different kinds of solid state lighting. So it predicted a lot of things like that. It predicted aspheric lenses uh, being mass produced. But the United States did not institute any policies around that. But countries like Korea, Singapore, China, France, Germany looked at this report that was released in the United States and said, let's make that the basis for our economic development policies going into the 21st century. Well, the scientists and the, the, the scientific societies in the United States observed this and said, we need to recreate that report because technology has changed so much in the past uh, 18 years or so. They rele released here in Rochester two years ago, they debuted the report, Optics and Photonics, Essential Technologies for Our Nation, and then began a national photonics initiative. So that's something that Rochester is playing a role in. We've been down, we've talked to uh, politicians, letting them know, giving the same kind of presentation. In fact, Louise Slaughter asked, called uh, us last week and asked for these talking points so she could share them in Washington in a talk she was giving. And um, there, there we are last year. We gave Louise uh, an, an Optics and Photonics Award because she has been responsible for lobbying and, and successfully getting close to a billion dollars over the past 15 years for the Laboratory for Laser Ener Energetics for the research done over on River Road. Um, do you remember a couple of weeks ago when Joe Biden was in town? Did you actually listen to his talk? It, it was long. If you weren't there, it, it, he spoke for a little over 50 minutes, and I, I couldn't make it to the meeting, but I was getting 
emails and tweets telling me he spent 30 minutes of his talk talking about optics, acknowledging Jim and Jim's company, Mike Mandina and Optimax out in, uh, in uh, uh, Ontario. Ontario County. And so Louise is bullish on optics and photonics. Joe Biden is bullish on optics and photonics. And the next day, they invited Mike Mandina down to Washington, introduced him into, uh, to the President of the United States, who is also bullish on optics and photonics. So we're starting to make some progress. <laughs> and you remember this guy? This guy's bullish on optics and photonics. <laughs> that little device there, that's all about optics and photonics. Um, it's in everything, and, and I'm hoping that after this little talk that we were able to share with you today, um, you'll be able to speak a little more coherently about how important optics and photonics are to our lives and how important they are to Rochester. Thank you. Thank you so much for your interest. In